Welcome everybody to the International Leadership Conference. Good morning. We're very excited to have all of you here today. Our, our themes for this, the next few days from today, tomorrow and the next day, July 27th through the 29th is best practices in track two diplomacy. Today you're joining us for our opening session where we can prepare and be greeted by incredible VIPs and leaders from the United States. So first I would like to welcome Dr. Michael Jenkins. He is the president of UPF International, Universal Peace Federation International. Welcome Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, Kayla, And welcome to our audience throughout America and some throughout the world. The president of the Universal Peace Federation International, as well as the chairman for the UPF of North America. It's very, very uh, wonderful to be able to spend this time with you. As Kayleigh mentioned, our program for the next three days is a number of sessions on track two diplomacy and how we might bring enemy nations together uh, to bring peace. And what we've found is that when you engage with an understanding of listening and also embracing and serving others, uh, you can open a way for common ground to appear. And that is our founder's intention, uh, Dr. Hak Chan Moon, who co-founded the UPF and the International Leadership Conference with her husband, her late husband, a Reverend Dr. Sum Young Moon. And what that is really all about is that we need to bring peace, starting with the family, to our community, society, nation and world. How do we do that? Again, finding common ground and serving one another and also developing an attitude to really help better the circumstances of whoever we're relating with, whether it be in our family or even presidents of different nations. We are finding that this possibility of bringing peace is real. And this uh, program for the next three days is a little different from the programs we've shared before. The International Leadership Conference has programs for people in the intelligence community, people in the State Department, also in the Congress, also in the White House, and throughout all sectors of government, and also professors in education, business, media, also uh, religious leaders. But our sessions primarily have focused on bringing peace in Northeast Asia, helping out for uh, the Middle East conflicts and that kind of thing. Uh, but generally speaking, we've been dealing a lot with the uh, track one diplomacy, where it's really between officials and scholars and others who are working together to try to advance peace between nations. Track two diplomacy, however, uses what is called soft power. And that is where you engage with the purpose of bringing peace, but you're not engaging so much on the segments of political areas, but you're engaging much more on human interest, human needs, and the need for cooperation to bring a better world. And so in our program, you're going to be very, very excited to see uh, what culture and art have already been done to bring exchange between North Korea and South Korea. You're going to see also how humanitarian aid to troubled parts of Africa and the world, and especially, again, we're focused on Northeast Asia right now, but how medical supplies and equipment and food, uh, humanitarian aid from the, the World Food Organization with Governor David Beasley, who is the Nobel Prize winning organization that he is leading, how they have done enormous work to alleviate the starvation in North Korea. And that kind of thing is, even though there's ideological differences and problems between nations, yeah, when you touch people by serving their needs and saving lives, it really opens the door. We're going to have a really great session. I'm very honored that uh, the global chairman of the International Association of Parliamentarians for Peace is here with us, Congressman Dan Burton, and also Dr. Luan Rouse, who's the co-chairman of the American Clergy Leadership Conference. So we'll have a really broad spectrum of key people who are leading the way for peace. So we welcome you. I want to thank our chairman, Dr. Thomas Walsh, who really has helped lead this ILC movement to be global. Now, just think about this. We have programs going on in every continent this week, every continent, Asia, South uh, and Central America. We have Africa 
and also Europe and the Middle East and also Eastern Europe, everywhere in the world, there's a conference going on this week. So we're collaborating together to build a consortium, a virtual consortium of experts in every area uh, to be able to bring peace. And that's called Think Tank 2022. Think Tank 2022 is, is in a consortium of, of informal relations, but actually they all have formal connections of influence in their countries. So again, I congratulate you all for putting this session together and I really, really look forward to hearing your comments and the expertise of our, of our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jenkins, and for your incredible leadership leading all of us through this ILC in the next few days. At this time, we'd like to share an introductory video with everybody explaining the incredible work of Universal Peace Federation. Please enjoy. The world is battling with a global pandemic and fears over long-term environmental damage. National lockdowns have seen an increase in isolation and a growing sense of hopelessness. To address this crisis, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon and the Universal Peace Federation initiated an ambitious online program called Rally of Hope, which provides an opportunity for current and former heads of state and government, leading politicians, religious leaders and Nobel laureates to present their vision for a peaceful and sustainable world. As the rallies have grown, so have their audiences, and they now link millions of people across the globe. Building partnership across a wide range of sectors is imperative if we are to build a better world. I believe that the Universal Peace Federation and its a broad set of partnerships serve as a good model. I'm honored to address you at this Global Rally of Hope, sponsored by the Universal Peace Federation, and join you in the great cause of building a more peaceful and prosperous world. During my four years as Vice President, at home and abroad, I've seen firsthand the strong families, education, equal treatment under the law, and a recognition of the dignity and worth of every human life is the foundation of true national greatness. With free people, strong nations, and bold leaders, there's no limit to what we can achieve. These rallies have created a foundation inviting international and interreligious collaboration in the achievement of peace among our nations. We can transcend the barriers we have created through religion, nationality, cultures, class, creed, and other differences that divide us. 35 years ago, the situation that confronted us in South Africa appeared to be hopeless. We were increasingly isolated without friends or allies in the world. However, we finally made it to our first fully inclusive elections on 27 April 1994, to the inauguration of President Mandela and to the adoption of a truly inclusive and democratic constitution. But above all, we have learned the importance of never losing hope. The upliftment of the common good over and above personal interests is a sure way to eliminating conflict and a pathway to attaining peaceful growth and development in Africa and the world. We must recognize the history shows that the rights and freedoms of ordinary people are critical to creating and sustaining our prosperity and peace over time. If there is any organization capable of convening a truly global network of people to genuinely shared efforts, then it is this one, the Universal Peace Federation. The issues being taken up in this rally are indeed critical to the challenges of our time and need to be accorded the highest priority. It is important for us to address them so that this collective effort will reinforce attention on these concerns. 
Let us promote a culture of peace and harmony around the world. Let us work to heal the broken trust that has fractured societies. Let us encourage facts and truth instead of hatred and bigotry. Let's also instill a sense of hope and future in our youth. Back in September 2010, it was, for me as the then Prime Minister, and for my compatriots, such an unforgettable experience to host a delegation of the Universal Peace Federation and of the world-class Little Angel Children's Dance Troupe and Choir in Brussels. Your work is important. Your work is crucial. Your work is the pathway to a better future, a beacon of hope in these darkest times. We still have a very long way to go before every child in every part of the world has enough to eat. But the Republic of Korea story gives me hope for the future. WP started working in the country way back in 1964 in the aftermath of the Korean War. And for 20 years, we supported the Korean people with food assistance. And during this period, the country, the people, rebuilt itself from the ground up. In just one generation, the Republic of Korea went from aid recipient to aid donor. It was important to us that we were making a vaccine for the world and that it should be made widely available with no profit during the pandemic or at any time for vaccine used in low and middle income countries. AstraZeneca shared our vision. This vaccine was made for all of us to protect each other and ourselves. When I had the honor to receive on behalf of the European Union the Nobel Peace Prize, in 2012 in Oslo, I had the occasion to underline the very close link between peace and also the values we have in a society. The society at all levels, starting with the family. It is our most basic community. There is one word that has great meaning to us all, and that is the word family. Family is the root of everything we are. Family is what binds us together, and family is the cornerstone of world peace. 있습니다. And all these faiths have one purpose. Hence, I sincerely hope that you will let all people know about our Creator and work to realize a world of peace wherein all people live in unity as one family of humankind, one great family under our heavenly parent. Please raise your voices and work together for this. I give you my blessing. What Mother Moon has done in carrying on the work of her husband in building a worldwide movement committed to the concept that we can find ways to talk with each other, we can find ways to work together, is a key to a successful future. And so I think you taking your time to be involved in this meeting is really important. More rallies of hope are planned in the coming months through featuring significant world leaders and luminaries. As viewer numbers continue to increase, this forum offers a great chance to inspire and connect people through its twin messages of hope and peace. Thank you very much. As you can see from that video, UPF is connected to an incredible group of leaders from all over the world who are really working together to bring about peace. And um, our next speaker is, a, is an outstanding example of that. We have Honorable Dan Burton, who was a member of the US House of Representatives from 1983 to 2013, and is now the global co-chairman of one of the associations of UPF, the International Association of Parliamentarians for Peace. Congressman Burton, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Kaylee, very much. Uh, as usual, you do a great job. Uh, let me start off by saying, after watching that video that starts the program today, uh, it's amazing how Mother Moon, Dr. Hak Shahan Moon, has been able to bring these leaders together through UPF. Her, uh, she and Dr. Walsh and, and Dr. Jenkins and, and, and many, many other people that I have too many to name, they do so much and work so hard to bring about peace. And that's why I think these, these uh, conferences are so important because it extends the reach of their efforts to bring about peace for the world. 
Uh, today we're going to be, in the next three days, you're going to be talking about other ways to bring about peace and solve the world's problems. Governmental leaders, they try to do their part. Uh, but it's important, very important, that people in other walks of life do their very best to help and bring to help to bring about peace in this world. And one of the biggest areas that we'd like to see uh, resolved the problems in North and South Korea. Uh, that's one of the things they've been working on through UPF for a long, long time. And because of the importance of that part of the world and that that uh, continent or that those two countries, it's extremely important that we put that at the forefront so we don't see another conflict break out that will cause severe problems in this, in this world. So today, in my short period of time, I'd like to say to all the people who are watching around the world, it's important that you get involved, that your organizations get involved, that your non-governmental organizations get involved and your religious groups to talk about world peace. In a world like what we have today with the virus and with the threat of uh, possibly even nuclear war, it's so important that we realize the paramount objective, the paramount objective that we ought to seek is a peaceful world. And everyone working together and talking together about this, I think, can reach that goal. I'm honored to be the co-chair of the International Parliamentarians for Peace. And we've been reaching out to parliamentarians and ex-parliamentarians all over the world. We have thousands that are now involved, but we need more people involved. And that's why I say to all of you who are watching today, please get involved. Talk to your leaders in your country, not just the governmental leaders, but the people in all walks of life, the NGOs, the church people. Talk to them about getting involved in the quest for world peace and solving these problems. If we all get together and do that, I'm sure things will be good throughout the 21st century. And with that, thank you for letting me say a few words today. It's really nice to be with you and God bless you all. Thank you, Congressman Bergen. Those were excellent opening remarks and really appreciate your call to action to all of the leaders watching today to get involved in this important effort for peace in the world. With that, I'd like to welcome our last speaker for this opening session. We have Dr. Luan Rouse. He is the co-chairman of the American Clergy Leadership Conference Dr. Rouse, we're excited to have you with us this morning. Thank you, Mrs. Moffitt. It is my indeed honor to be with you today and to thank those who are leading forth with the ILC, the best practices and track to diplomacy. I join you today on behalf of the American Clergy Leadership Conference, Dr. Chungshik Yong, as we represent in the United States of America, the ideals and the desires, of the heart of God with the heart of Dr. Hachahan Moon, the true mother of peace, in leading forth a heavenly path to peaceful reunification on the Korean Peninsula. A peaceful goal is for both North and South Korea. The leaders there are desiring to be united in heart, united in mind, united in spirit. Historical disruptions have brought them to the course that they are currently on. Dr. Hachahan Moon, mother of peace, daughter of God, has spoken for the chosen to lead a heavenly reunification path that we may follow away from a 71 years path of violence, separation, and lingering threat of nuclear harm. She has asked us to be on the path to heavenly reunification and encourage the participant to be excited, inspired, and in proclaiming throughout the world, peace starts with me. As a part of the American Clergy Leadership Conference, it is our ultimate desire to be 
as we were meant to be when founded on May the 21st of 2000 in Korea. When 120 clergy gathered to affirm God's given vision to Reverend Dr. Sangyang Moon and Dr. Hachahan Moon for the reunification and dedication of the body of Christ to bringing about unity among world Christianity. And that through that unity, Christians would reach out to clergy who are existing around the world with religious leaders to be one in uniting families to work for God, our heavenly parent, as a holy community, not only throughout America, but throughout the world. It is our joy and privilege to unite with those who on January the 27th of 2018 at a True Family Values Conference in Chicago to start the Interreligious Association for Peace and Development. That association is operating today to extend but Dr. Thomas Ross was experienced enough to start in Seoul, Korea in November the 18th of 2017, where the International Association for Peace and Development brought together 400 religious leaders, including 200 from America, to have Christianity join with Islam, Judaism, and other major religions to see that we could work in harmony together and bring about what is necessary to heal the world and to work for reconciliation and full understanding and cooperation towards world peace. True Mother, is leading us in joining hands with civic leaders of other communities and nation to remain on a path of a new direction for peace to be genuine, real, and cooperative for everyone. One that seeks to resolve conflict through dialogue and understanding. True parents go for reconciliation is not an untouchable ideal only to be followed. Rather, it's a belief to be achieved. And because of that, we are in these challenging time of COVID, community crisis, reoccurring violence, financial hardship, a continuing division between North Korea and South Korea. Remaining in harmony with the intentions of God, for we don't know what tension might rise next. What we do know is that the true mother of peace still believes in showing a way to peace. The mother of peace through various types of peace and blessing testables, have called on us in the midst of a diversity of culture with musical artists to including the little angels founded by true parents to move in an anointed way as the American Clergy Leadership Conference to bring harmony that will lessen the gap that is existing between God's people today. today. So we are rekindling clergy, religious leaders to pray together, to stand together for a heavenly reunification in Korea. When we stand together, we move in a direction that is unstoppable 
by the forces and principalities that have been against the original intention of God. So in conclusion, I say to you today that the American Clergy Leadership Conference will continue to strive to officiate in the holy marriage blessing of one third of American Christian clergy and replicate that success in union with the Korean Clergy Leadership Conference on the Korean Peninsula. KCLC was inaugurated by True Mother in 2019. So that the clergy we bless in America, in Korea, will join together with the World Christian Leadership Conference that True Mother inaugurated on December 28th of 2019. To see that religious leaders throughout the world work immediately in harmony together but that by, that by 2027, we will have reached and blessed one third of the 7.8 billion people in the world with such striving, with such dedication, with such unity. We have no doubt that year by year, we're going to be successful in working with UPF and working with all of God's people in ushering in a full restoration of all people unto God Almighty, our heavenly parent. This is the desire of true parents. This is the direction of the mother of peace, the only begotten daughter. This is our mission to complete. Thank you, ILC, for calling others to be committed with us. God bless you in your work, lead in the way forward. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Rouse, for your really sincere and compelling words today. The perfect way to start off this international leadership conference really having that kind of perspective in mind of the world's religions coming together and the importance of spiritual leaders at this time. And with that in mind, I'd like to invite all of you to join me in an opening prayer as we kick off this ILC. Most beloved Heavenly Parent, good morning. Thank you so much for the incredible leaders from all over North America who are joining us today, God, to really work together, bring together our best practices to talk about how to bring peace, especially in the Korean Peninsula in this turbulent time, God. We pray for your presence and for you to use this time well. We offer all these things in your name we pray. Amen and adieu. So thank you for joining us for the opening session today, everybody. In just one minute, we're going to start our next session, which is the NGO Initiatives in Peace Building. So just stay here and uh, enjoy our video as you wait for the next session to begin. Thank you again for all of our panelists in this opening session. Good morning, everybody. I hope 
you have a well, depending on the time zone, it may be afternoon or night if you're logging in from uh, far away. Uh, my name is uh, Stefan Berg, and I'm going to uh, moderate the second session of this UPF International Leadership Conference on the theme, the best practices on in track to diplomacy for the peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula. I'm, uh, uh, when I'm not doing this, I am uh, working with UPF uh, project, the International Association for Academicians for Peace, IAAP, and I'm honored to moderate this session. And before we start, I just first like to thank you so much for dedicating your time in the pursuit of peace. I'm so glad you chosen to be here. And, uh, and uh, this short session is gonna highlight some important work of individual initiatives and collected together as non-governmental organizations, NGOs, for this eventual reconciliations of uh, the two Koreas. And I am so happy we have a star-studded banner of speakers. And our first speaker is Mrs. Jeannie Kagawa. She is the director of the executive office of UPF International. And uh, she's previously served as a regional secretary general of UPF in Asia, 1999 to 2007. And she worked with UN, many projects, she was elected the chairperson of the NGO subcommittee on spirituality values and global concerns at the UN from 2014 to 2018. And she's a presently a member of the UN executive committee on the moral imperative initiative to eradicate extreme poverty. You will have the pleasure to hearing from not somebody who just talks about international concerns, but she's a person, she's a global international person born in Colombia, Bogota, raised in the US, educated at the Sorbonne University in Paris. He worked for UNESCO and spent just about three decades in overseas assignment, Malaysia, Thailand, and Philippines, advocate, doing advocacy for peace and service projects for women and children under the umbrella of UPF. It's my great pleasure to invite Mrs. Jeannie Kagawa to take the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Berg, for your kind introduction. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to focus my presentation on the, uh, the best practice of UPF in working together with a nation at the United Nations. And so I'd like to share this very brief PowerPoint with everyone. My goodness, where is it now? Oh, here. Everything occurs within a certain context. So when we want to talk about the initiative of UPF, based on the vision of Father and uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Samyang Moon and his wife, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, whom we call Father and Mother Moon, they, they had a certain vision for the United Nations. So I'd like to talk about first the context of the United Nations and how the United Nations developed and how Father and Mother Moon viewed the United Nations and why they wanted to put an interreligious council at the UN. Um, we even have to question ourselves as history has developed even to our century, we're constantly questioning whether this could really be an era of peace. There's so many conflicts, so many tensions, will the economic and political solution be enough to solve all these burning issues. And so I'd like to turn the attention to the United Nations and the context in which the United Nations was given birth in 1945. There was untold um, sorrow and heartbreak due to two world wars. And um, 
religious leaders and as well as civic leaders and government leaders came together and said, we need an institution of peace so that this, we have to save the world from the scourge of generations and generations of war. And so there was very strong passion. There was very strong commitment to bring peace through a peace institution as the, as the United Nations. And emphasis, they emphasized human rights, dignity, and the worth of human beings, equality between men and women, justice, respect, and social progress. And when we look back over these years, we wonder what has the UN accomplished? As somebody said in the panel <laughs> today, what has the UN accomplished? And I believe that over since the beginning of of uh, putting together of the UN Charter, there were many religious leaders who inserted words on spiritual principles and universal principles, compassion, kindness, inclusiveness, etc. However, the political reality of the United Nations was that Russia was on the Security Council. And therefore, there was a strong emphasis to develop the United Nations as a secular institution. And this is where the United Nations began to emphasize only political and economic solutions. And they ignored all the other possibilities for you know, providing a, a more uh, holistic view of human beings and their worth and their dignity and so on. And so over the years, we see that there was great, there was great limitation for the United Nations to, to bring adequate solutions to human beings as, as um, even Kofi Annan at one point, he really saw the need during his term from 1997 to 2006, he, he made extreme effort to bring together international institutions, civil society, other sectors in the pursuit of these common goals, because he saw that unless we have this viewpoint, the United Nations could not really, really bring the lasting solution of peace to the world. Um, that's why when our founder, Father and Mother Moon, when he realized the state of the United Nations, he felt a very, very passionate urgency to renew the United Nations. And he had a meeting at the United Nations in August 18th of the year 2000 and put forward his solution, how to revive, how to awaken, how to renew, how to bring what the United Nations vision wanted to embody in the UN Charter, how to bring that to humankind. And so Father and Mother Moon pr proposed to renew the United Nations. Father Moon said, I believe that there's an urgent need today within the United Nations and through its many activities to encourage mutual respect and increased cooperation between the world's political and religious leaders. And you heard through Dr. Rouse, the passion of uh, the religious leaders and their capability if it, in unity, what they can do to bring awakening and bring renewal to this world. And Father was very much aware of it and had a very, very deep sense of empathy. Um, he said he, 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 at the United Nations itself, he made a proposal and made a serious consider, he said, I, I submit a serious consideration that should be given to form a religious assembly or council within the structure of the United Nations because the wisdom and vision of great religious leaders will substantially supplement political insight, experience, and the skill of world political leaders. Um, as you know, after this great inspirational meeting, conference at the United Nations, the world again was experiencing extreme serious devastation due to 9-11. The 9-11 incident was not only a problem at the United, uh, of the United States, it was a global problem. And it brought great division between religious institutions, especially between Christianity and Islam. But not only that, that form of violence had a serious effect on all humankind. 
And therefore, Father Moon had a, an increased sense of urgency that to do something about it, that the United Nations itself would perish if humankind continues on this road of violence and wars and extreme, um, you know, extreme behavior. Therefore, um, Father Moon wanted to take action. He knew that at the United Nations, you need to work with a country. And he was looking for one country to represent the United Nations, to lead the way, to spearhead, and to make it possible for his vision to come about. Therefore, the country of Philippines was chosen at that time to be that nation, to spearhead this movement at the United Nations. And, and our closest ambassador for peace, our um, chair emeritus of U UPF for so many years, Honorable Speaker de Venetia, was the person that Father Moon wanted to designate to, to see if it was possible if the Philippines could be that nation. And our chairman of UPF, Dr. Thomas Walsh, made a visit to the Philippines and submitted Father Moon's proposal to him gave his proposal to an honorable de Venetia. He has had much experience as a journalist and therefore he knew that it was very, very crucial for religions to come together to put together these broken pieces in humankind. So he listened to the proposal. Dr. Walsh came with a Two page, two page res draft resolution. It was whereas, 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 be it resolved, be it resolved, be it resolved. It was a two page resolution. And, you know, explained this proposal of Father Moon's to Speaker de Venetia. And he was so excited and he became so passionate. And he said, We will do it. He said, We will do it. And um, after Dr. Walsh returned to the headquarters, he turned to his, um, the, uh, the head of state, Her Excellency Gloria Macabal, uh, Macabal Arroyo, <laughs> Macabal Arroyo. And, um, you know, he explained this proposal to, to, to her and they had a cabinet meeting and everyone in the cabinet was, was very passionate and excited about Father Moon's idea about introducing an interreligious council at the UN. And they approved it unanimously. Therefore, Philippines signed at that meeting, at the cabinet meeting, that the introduction of this interreligious council at the UN would be the main foreign policy of the Philippines. And as Speaker de Venetia and other dignitaries from the Department of Foreign Affairs made a trip to the United States in order to request the United States to co-sponsor this resolution at the UN. And he met with Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell and many, many dignitaries in the US. And um, they were all very positive and they thought this is very beneficial for humankind and let's try to do it. <laughs> but many months later, because of the stigma of 9-11, I believe, and because of the, the devastation uh, in New York and um, the atmosphere, the global atmosphere, there was hesitation. Finally, a few months later, um, the United States and also Western countries such as European Union, Australia, New Zealand, none of them had the courage to co-sponsor this resolution at the UN. And so the Philippines had a very, very difficult task. The Philippine mission had an extremely difficult task of going mission by mission, requesting nations to co-sponsor this resolution. Um, there were three resolu resolutions that the Philippines introduced at the United Nations at that time. And the first one was November 2004, just a simple resolution asking for the promotion of interreligious dialogue and cooperation for peace at the UN. So that two page resolution, draft resolution of our chairman, <laughs> Dr. Walsh, just became a paragraph. <laughs> It was a very, very, very simple paragraph that finally passed at the General Assembly in January 6th of 2006, but it was a beginning. 
it was a start. And at that time, also, there was a call later on, there was another resolution passed at the UN later on that year, asking for a focal unit in the Secretariat to handle these matters. Once something like that is passed at the UN, then at least there's some, some kind of substance and there could be follow through at the, at the UN. And so this was already a, a very, very great accomplishment. And 23 countries, finally, 23 countries co-sponsored this resolution and it was passed twice in the General Assembly. Now to show you the effort of the Philippine mission at the UN, <laughs> these are all the dates continuously every year, every year, every year, the Philippines introduced a, a, a more substantial resolution, more content, brought in more agencies and um, even brought in UNESCO. One resolution was calling for UNESCO to take part in the dialogue among the different religions. And later on the UN, um, the UN, um, um, the UN uh, uh, Association of, um, uh, rec uh, uh, let me see, the UN AOC, the UN uh, Council for uh, Reconciliation and Peace. And then, um, finally, in 2009, there were 63 nations who co-sponsored this resolution. And I think all of you are quite familiar with World Interfaith Harmony Week in, in the 2010, the uh, Jordan mission, the King, the King of Jordan, spearheaded a resolution for the celebration of World Interfaith Harmony Week by all the agencies of the UN, all the, the member states, all the nations and around the world and six countries co-sponsored it, but it has almost become a fad at the UN. So I can testify that in the days that when I was at the UN in 2007, the word God and the word religion was not allowed to be spoken at the UN, but because of these efforts of one nation that was on fire and, and inspired by Father Moon and Mrs. and Mother Moon's vision, they were able to achieve this incredible result at the United Nations. And now it is a fad. I think everyone can say interfaith, everyone's talking about interfaith dialogue as a solution for peace. Interreligious dialogue is reviving and reawakening nations and peoples and bringing together the impossible dream that all of us want as one united world. So um, what is this, the, the, the strength of having a, an NGO work with a country? What, what, does, what do the NGOs really provide for this peace building? What, what kind of platform do they have that nations really need? And I, I, I just wrote down a few points because an, an NGO, for example, UPF can convene very, all, all kinds of diverse stakeholders to advance the goal of peace and bring new approaches and new solutions that governments are limited in the way because they are just emphasizing economy and politics. And then they can organize models around these priority goals that the UN has, such as peace building or even economic inclusion or poverty eradication or recovery from the COVID. And NGOs are free to create these models and they have a, a, a distribution method and platform for soliciting and featuring and sharing these new innovations and new solutions. And then NGOs can identify synergies of like-minded people to come together and to work together with us for these mutual goals. And also, um, which is very important at the United Nations, they can identify and they feature best practices. So I would say that the um, introduction of an interreligious council at the UN promoted by Father and Mother Moon is a best practice which has now been you know, caught fire by other organizations or other religious movements or other religions. And this best, best, best practice at the UN usually is a, accompanied by case studies. So what, what brings the strength to a, an NGO um, proposal at the UN is that there are case models, case models and um, case studies and evidence of what is working as opposed to what is not working. You can see very clearly, the facts are there, the science is there, the evidence is, we say evidence-based strategies or evidence-based programs will 
clearly show what is working. And therefore, there is no dispute that this way of working is going to bring the solution. And this is what religions and religious movements have been able to do at the UN is to show the best practice that really works. And also, especially like during the, the COVID, we've, we've realized that uh, despite these severe social and economic impacts that are going on worldwide, or even if there's war or conflict, NGOs will continue to serve on the front line everywhere. And they are well positioned because they have their ear to the ground. They have their boots on the ground. They've been working with people for years in no, no, trouble no. there is. Uh, we have, um, I, you have so many good things to say, but could you- <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and then I just want to emphasize that the holistic approach of NGOs is what is really going to um, offer the solution for peace building at the UN and can offer that as a, um, as a, an ultimate solution for the humankind. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Kagawa. You have really shared uh, deep and insightful content. And I really shown that what one man can do and one woman can do to influence this global organization of the United Nations to change the world and bring a dialogue. Uh, that is wonderful. We really appreciate that. And I'm sure you have many more words of wisdom from your years at the UN and elsewhere to, uh, uh, to share with us. But in the interest of time, we need to move on to our uh, next speaker. Actually, we have a very short uh, uh, presentation time allotted to us today. So I apologize for that. And I also want to apologize for the technical issues in maybe getting the audio across in this session. And I, uh, that happens sometimes. Anyway, we have a wonderful <clears throat> speaker coming up now. She's also a global personality, uh, Mrs. Tomiko Duggan. She's a senior vice president of the Universal Peace Federation USA and the USA coordinator of the Interreligious Association for Peace and Development, IAPD. She is uh, herself a global, she's hailing from Japan, but she has traveled to more than 60 nations organizing conferences, symposia, fact-finding tours, and bringing to, and she's aiming to bring together opinion leaders, educators, and other professionals to help world peace to come about. And she currently focuses on connecting religious leaders through interfaith dialogue with IAPD and allow a global perspective to come to the fore with the spiritual and physical well being of their local communities in service of the world. So, without further ado, this is Tommy Duggan. The floor is yours. Good morning, Dr. Stefan. Thank you so much. I'll begin. Time is short. <laughs> so when I was a sixth grader in Japan, I had two classmates whose parents were Korean. I vividly remember one telling me that she was going back to North Korea with her family after finishing the school year. She told our school friends that North Korean government was preparing jobs and nice houses for those Koreans living in Japan and encouraging them to return their families to North Korea, where their lives would be so much better in the ideal society that was being built. So her family decided to return after her graduation. The other family decided to stay behind in Japan, not to return to North Korea. These returning families were, of course, deceived by the propaganda and promises in the 1960s about life in North Korea, and then found themselves unable to revisit Japan, even if it were only to see aging parents and relatives before they died. We are now learning more and more of the enormous suffering of those trapped behind the borders of North Korean states 
by the late 70th plus years division of the Korean Peninsula. I still remember, I still wonder what my former classmate's life might have become and or if her family even survived. In the late 1970, I was involved with the project supporting the repatriation of Japanese wives and children who followed their husband and the fathers and immigrated to North Korea. I read the government censored and the redacted letters from those Japanese wives pleading for permission to revisit families in Japan and then pleading for Japanese goods to be sent to them for some relief from their harsh lives. The co-founder of the Universal Peace Federation, the late Reverend Sammyeon Moon, and his wife, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, visited North Korea in December in 1991 through an invitation from the great leader Kim Il-sung and personal meetings with him during their trip in North Korea. When Reverend Moon was a younger man and passionate evangelist in North Korea, Kim Il-sung, his government arrested and tortured Reverend Moon and left nearly for dead. Later he was sent to Funan prison this notorious prison was a dead camp where prisoners were unlikely to survive for more than six months. Leva Moon survived for two years and was able to escape when the UN troops landed in Chon in 1952. In the intervening years, Reverend Moon had established global organizations and an international reputation for his bold leadership in many areas. The meeting of Reverend and Mrs. Moon was unexpected and unprecedented. Their surprising meetings became a model of people to people engagement with decades of animosity, suspicion and mistrust dissolved through the determination of a faith leader in the many remarkable result of this historic meeting of apparently lifelong enemies. Reverend Moon and Kim Il-sung redefined what many believed could be possible in the opening of North Korea. I will briefly mention two follow-on activities I directly participated in. Kim Il-sung knew that the Reverend Moon was famous for holding mass weddings. He invited couples from a recent marriage blessing ceremony to come to North Korea for their honeymoon. The government sponsored honeymoon trip took place in August 1992 with over 100 couples arriving in Pyongyang on a charter jet flown from Nagoya, Japan. I was honored to travel with them to assist these newly married and blessed couples. Another project that followed was the effort to open the protected and prized Mount Kungan area to international tourism. My second trip to North Korea resulted from my selection to work together with a liaison on the North Korean side for the project. I was invited to tour the Mount Kungan or Diamond Mountain area in North Korea in June, 1993. During those two North Korean trips, I met the privileged people who, who can live in Pyongyang. I have also encountered the suffering faces of the people in the rural, rural areas who are kept at the distance. Similar observations about the inequalities of a classless society are still being reported today by the travelers too and the refugees from North Korea. The work of faith began by Reverend and Mrs. Moon's effort to make peace with seemingly unrelating foe continues with Mrs. Moon's absolute unchanging commitment to peace in her homeland. Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, known for her work, in many nations as mother of peace. 
was born in Anju, North Korea, where the city is not far from the place where Reva Moon was born, approximately 30 minutes away by a car. At the outbreak of the Korean War, Dr. Hak Jaha Moon's grandmother made a decision to escape from North Korea, the dangerous escape to the South by three unaccompanied women. Grandmother, mother, and granddaughter was made when Mother Moon was just six years old. I recommend everyone read in Mother of Peace. Mrs. Moon's memoir that describes hardship of the refugee chaos in their walk of hundreds of miles with a lack of food and mortal fear of being found by North Korean soldiers. In her memoir, she comments, everybody desires peace, but peace does not come easily. If it were as commonplace as stones on the side of a country road or trees on the mountainside, we could never have experienced the terrible wars and conflict that plague the human world. Beginning peace demands that everyone invest sweat, tears, and sometimes blood. That is why, even though we long for peace, we seldom achieve it. My husband and I walked this path and are continuing on it. So Interreligious Association for Peace and Development, IAPD, is a project of the Universal Peace Federation. And through it, we are working to develop programs with the faith leaders. We recognize the capacity or capability and the real effectiveness of faith leaders in encouraging various forms of people-to-people -people engagement as a soft power or track two or three approach to peace and to addressing issues of concern and challenges related to current living conditions and humanitarian needs in North Korea. This IAPD webinar is specifically inviting faith leaders expert and concerned civic leaders to address issues on peace in the Korean Peninsula and asking them to offer their understanding and wisdom regarding steps toward the unification of the Korean Peninsula. Mother Moon in her memoir provides this insight and guidance. What will possibly bring the unification of the Korean Peninsula? Military power, economic power or political systems. They are all necessary, but if we only rely on secular power, it will not work. To experience and bring true peace, we must first practice true love without expectation of reward. The root of problem is not political nor economy. It is rooted in the mind of people. It is spiritual. With that understanding and for your fuller consideration, let me propose four basic principles for action for faith leaders and organizations. Number one, we must prevent war. Number two, we must promote track to non-governmental dialogue together with government representatives and track three, people-to-people -people exchange such as humanitarian action, including cultural exchange and medical assistance. Number three, we must seek to narrow the economic gap between North and South Korea and to help the shift from a militarily driven industries to people-centered industries in North Korea. Finally, number four, we must continue delivering the vision of peace and independence, mutual prosperity or co-prosperity and the shared universal values in making steps toward peace and the reunification of the Korean Peninsula. I just want to bring up my uh, the maybe 10 PowerPoints just to show you from that time. Just one minute. EJ, can you bring up? 
Okay, you can see this is a Korea. The first orange is going to uh, River Moon's birthplace. Second trip was Mount Kungan, number two. And this is a birthplace, River Moon, number two. Fra slide. Okay, this is over 100 Korean uh, nearly wedded, visited his birthplace. Number three. This is, I was, we are able to meet elder sister of Reverend Moon. The rice field where behind is the rice field Reverend Moon was planting when he was there planting rice. Okay, you can see this is a second trip. Everything so big in Korea, North Korea. Please remember, I was there 30 years ago. There was a no digital smartphone or inter internet. There's a so little information about North Korea, but you can see it's already beautiful statues there. Number two slides. We are able to see people in kids, well-dressed, beautiful. We are, talk we are able to talk to them. Number three slides. Okay, 30 years ago, like that. Number two slides. You can Google what it's like. This is a very famous place that's like like Red Square in Soviet, in Russia, like a Tiananmen Square, they have a beautiful square. So each landmark was built according to the very celebration of birthday of the founder, the great leader of Kim Il-sung. Next one. I just brought up, but this is the, what I Googled. You can really recommend Google now what it's like in North Korea. That years ago, I couldn't see it. Next one. You can see impressive buildings, but see, it's like a space <laughs> shuttle. <laughs> this is what it's like now. So number three, let's go. Mount Kungan. Oh, okay, so we considered, okay, here, uh, we considered North Korea as an enemy nation, but when we visit there, of course, they, they, they are not evil people. They best prepared best food that they can offer as a host and people, and best food, you can see. Okay, so the reason one slide back, you can see I brought this. I live, my homeland is the other side of Japan. This is the other side of North Korea on the east. I realized it's very similar to my hometown. That's why I wanted to show very similar, the other side, both sides of Japan Sea. Okay, beautiful people, let's, yeah, hospitality, they took care of them. Okay, this is top of Mount Kungan. You can see it's really beautiful, rocky mountains. The height is 1600 meters. I was, this is a tourist spot actually. Next one. See, kids can well <laughs> come to the, this tourist spot. The reason is right behind 1000 meters below straight, you can see beautiful ponds. There's a story, eight, eight angels came down from the heaven and they made their footsteps became, okay, this is a very particular uh, ship. This is a gift from Koreans who live in Japan. You can see huge, this is a gift for uh, greater Kim Il-sung's birthday. I forgot which year, 80 or 60 years. This is a gift from ja Koreans who live in Japan. Okay. So this is a book written, I wish I had wings to fly over to take care of my mother, aging mothers. This is a book published, very inter interesting. Okay, so you can go quickly. So IAPD of Unification, uh, the UPF, we uh, from last December, every month, we invite faith leaders to come and talk about how we can bring peace and the reunification of the uh, Korean Peninsula. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stefan. Thank you very much, Mrs. Duggan. <laughs> thank you very much for that personal testimony. <laughs> it always moves people's heart when you've been there and <laughs> moved your heart. So it's wonderful. Thank you so much. And I, I can get from both of our lady presenters that they have so much more to share. And that is wonderful. It's because this is moving our hearts and that's so important. The next person, our next speaker is going to 
come to us through a video already edited, ready to go. He is, per, he is a person who is calling himself the happiest man in the world because he gave up his economic career as an international consultant to developing nations around the globe because he saw a need. He saw a need of the sick and dying. And he was, his heart was moved. And Dr. Jackson, Dr. James W. Jackson, the founder and chairman emeritus of the board of Project Cure has been traveling over 25 years to give health and hope to the world, over 150 countries. And there are literally thousands of people who are alive today because what he has done. He's gonna share briefly now about um, his trips and experiences with North Korea. So thank you very much for your patience to stick with us. Here's a video. Today, uh, I would just like to, to maybe relax a little bit and talk about a subject um, maybe we might hit it known as relationships because the more I think about this and the more I think about what um, you folks are, are doing uh, in your efforts for peace uh, and then kind of reflecting back on, on um, our, our experiences with, um, with a lot of different national leaders and, and uh, in 150 different countries in the world I've traveled in, and I have just gained lots of memory. And I was in, in, in um, Seoul and somebody said, would you like to go to Pyongyang and go to the 38th parallel? Of course, I said, oh, yes. And somebody asked me as we were out there with all that confusion and, and stuff. They said, Dr. Jackson, would you go to North Korea if you had the chance with your medical things? And I said, yes, I don't have any contacts at all. But yes, I would do that. And so one of the fellows in the group had a, had a contact with a, um, a leader in the, in the U.S. military. Uh, camp there, and he had, had previously been friends, and somehow he got a hold of this leader, and he knew of another contact, and eventually he knew of the fellow in New York City at, at the UN, and, and I was connected with, with the ambassador of the UN. We talked about uh, the possibilities, and everybody got excited about it, and so uh, lo and behold, I ended up with a, a personal invitation from great leader Kim Il-sung to attend his 81st birthday at the Friendship Festival on April 15th of 93. Um, and one of the things that, that um, uh, I had, I had um, uh, in the process, I had met up with the ambassador. He said that I could meet him in downtown Manhattan at the Sheridan Hotel. Um, and so we made an appointment at 10 o'clock. And, and um, sure enough, we found each other. And, and he asked me about Project Cure. And I told him a little of the work that we were doing to scope around the world and, and, the, and the countries that we were already in and those kinds of things. And he looked at me and <laughs> took another 20 minutes telling me that we have every bit as good a medical um, uh, service in the Kim Man Yu Hospital as anything in the United States. And we don't need your help and on and on. And, and I'm going, oh, Oops. And so it was about uh, noon and we were sitting at a round table there in, in the coffee shop and we decided to go ahead and go to the buffet line. So as we were standing in the buffet line, uh, you never, you never meet with a North Korean uh, without being two. I've never, I've always, there's always been two. And so the other man, Mr. Dong, uh, was standing right behind me in the, in the, in the line and, and he was tugging on my sleeve as we're standing there. And he said, Dr. Jackson, I need to say something. I, I know what the ambassador just told you. And I know what you heard. But he said, somehow, I need to communicate to you. We in, in, in DPRK, as far as health, we need everything. We need, to have, we need to work together. Well, that was a changer. And that's what made me decide to, to go to, to 
uh, to Pyongyang. When I got to the festival, it was, it was wonderful. Uh, right away, um, uh, it was kind of a hit. I had I'd known a guy that worked at Siemens Medical, and he was able to, to get for me, procure the, the slickest uh, portable EKG machine that you can imagine, it's just like the one uh, like President Bush wore and stuff. And it was remote control. <laughs> it, was, it was really slick. And I personally gave it to, to, to Great Leader Kim il -sung, and I said, this is, this is given to you uh, with my personal hopes that it will keep you healthy and you will live forever. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I was invited back um, a t uh, and we delivered. Uh, I, in fact, I brought, I invited the, 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 the um, ambassador from New York City to come to my warehouses we had pulled it and sat ready to be loaded into, into containers, uh, almost a half a million dollars worth of things. And the, and the, the ambassador and, and Mr. Dong, they were just flabbergasted. Is this is for us? No one has ever done this for us. Well, then we had to go through how we get the stuff delivered and whatnot and, and through, through uh, um, uh, the customs and borders and all of that. and and. We worked it out. Um, another occasion, I happened to be in Pyongyang, Pyongyang uh, when they had the dam break in the eighty nine in the ninety five uh, on the Yalu River, and I was providentially they were cross docking because you couldn't you couldn't ship the things in from from uh, directly from U S into 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 Nampo port. You had to you had to cross dock because they wouldn't allow you to enter into their Port city, and unless you were flying a, a DPRK flag, so here I am cross docking, unloading, so we can load two full containers of medical things, and and this flood hits, and they said, nobody has ever done this. You are the first one to ever bring things and not ask anything in return. Uh, how, did, how did you know we were going to have a flood? <laughs> I just laughed and said, I didn't know we go on like this, but. I need to I need to underscore the fact nothing is going to happen in that wonderful country except what's built on relationships. Uh, yes, they are a hurting country. Yes, they are so confused because here all the time they were giving all of this idea of juchi. We we are self-reliant. We pull ourselves up by our own bootstrap. We need nothing. We have better everything, everything, everything. Oh, in '91 when they when everything dried up. Here they are at a crux. They've said they have juchi, they need nothing, and yet now they they have they need everything. So we worked there for well for about ten years. Uh, I had the privilege of rebuilding, uh, refurbishing uh, their their rural hospitals or I mean clinics. There are over four thousand of them. We we've, we've helped in those ways. Um, it's just been a wonderful thing. But but my my word of encouragement would simply be make good relationships. Very they, good. Will, they will test you. I can tell you that. But if, if you are, are sincere and, and they catch the idea that you are really there to help them and not to coerce them into this or that or, or you have going to play tricks on, on this or that. Uh, and it is possible. So I, I won't take any more of the time, but, but that, those are some of my, some of my reflections and my admonitions, uh, do what you're doing and go in with, with the heart of, of helping them be better off in this world and our world will be better off for your efforts. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those words. Um, I say this to a video, but Dr. Jackson really shared uh, wonderfully, I have to say, and uh, I appreciate uh, uh, all that, um, all those words of wisdom. And it's amazing when somebody again has been there and giving the heart. I don't know, do you see me? I don't know if anybody sees me, but anyway, <laughs> I'm going on here. Uh, somebody uh, like Mrs. Duggan, Mrs. Uh, Kagawa, and uh, now 
Dr. Jackson, have been there and done good thing following the heart, and especially as, uh, as uh, Dr. Jackson went in, he's gone into North Korea many times to help them. Amazing, amazing work. So I really appreciate that. And I appreciate all of you. And the, the real, um, uh, the full video was from um, April 13, 2021. Mm -hmm. And we took it from a seminar uh, where he shared much more. But as in the interest of time, we do cut it short. And I appreciate you here and, um, and you taking this time, even though we went a little bit over, uh, I appreciate you listening to these testimonies, these stories, this heart of caring. And it seems like that's a message of, um, of uh, the speakers, the heart of caring that can change the world. So I thank you very much for being here. The next session going to be uh, Eastern time at one o'clock. And that's a session three, according to the schedule, uh, the role of faith leaders in track to diplomacy. So uh, without further ado, I just want to say thank you very much for joining with us. And I look forward to see you again very soon. God bless you.